morning. I'm Mike Copenhafer, president of Fisher Copenhafer Architecture and Interior Design and chairman of the Chambers Economic Development Council's Executive Committee. On behalf of the St. Johns County Chamber of Commerce and the Economic Development Council, I welcome you to, the to, to today's discussion with Flagler H Health Plus President and CEO, Jason Barrett. Jason, thank you for joining us today to provide an update on the COVID-19 pandemic, Flagler's response to the crisis, and to share with us some of Flagler's future plans. Before we begin, I'd like to invite our audience to submit your questions in writing using the chat feature at the bottom of your screen. Jason and the team have offered to answer your questions at the end of the discussion with time permitting. Now, I would like to introduce Jason Barrett. Jason is the President and Chief Executive Officer of Flagler Health Plus, an expansion of Flagler Hospital, which has been caring for the residents of St. Johns County since 1889. Flagler Health Plus is a total care enterprise aimed at advancing the physical, social, and economic health of Northeast Florida communities. Since joining the Flagler organization as Vice President of Operations in 2003, Mr. Barrett has served in a number of executive roles, including Chief Administrative Officer, Chief Integration Officer, Chief Operating Officer. Jason has served on the Chamber, Chamber's Economic Development Council Executive Committee and chaired the EDC in 2016 and 2017. Jason, the floor is yours. I'd like to begin by thanking and starting my presentation with an acknowledgement to the community. And um, Kathy, if you'd mind advancing the slide. Um, certainly everybody's lives have been disrupted by this pandemic. Um, and you know, whether it's been the, certainly the clinical impacts that we've seen in the state of Florida with almost 68,000 cases and almost 2,800 deaths. But, Focusing on what it has done, it has certainly demonstrated the strength of our community. Um, I cannot um, underscore or overestimate the level of support that we have had from the community, from our first responders to our local government, to other providers in the community, local business. Um, you have all been there to support us in our efforts in providing care. These, you know, as you can imagine, there's a fair amount of anxiety that goes along with what's going on, and um, the, the disruption has been very impactful. But despite that disruption, I've just been overwhelmed by the level of support from this community. So I think I would be remiss by not starting out with saying thank you. Um, you know, one other point that I would want to make, and it's a true testament to the people I work with. Um, you know, our caregivers and their courage is just something that, you know, I've just been so impressed with. These are the people that run into the burning building while everybody's running away. And um, I just have been so impressed with their courage and how they have addressed the cases and the fear that goes along with the unknown. So, um, again, I want to start off with a thank you to all involved and certainly to our business community and to Isabel and her team. They've been very supportive of our efforts. Kathy, if we could advance. So what I'd like to do is just take a few moments and level set in terms of our experience as it relates um, to the pandemic. And I would certainly want to address this from two lenses. One, from the standpoint of what the clinical impacts have been, how, our readiness, some of the obstacles that we've faced. But I would also underscore that there, is, there have been harsh financial impacts. And as an organization, we are the largest private employer in St. Johns County. We've, we have not, uh, you know, been shielded from the same financial impacts that a number of our small business partners and business partners in the community have taken on. So as it relates to the pandemic and our experience with COVID, it, it began for us on March 10th. Um, we have stood up, we have a process which we deal with emergency management, which, which is our incident command system, which we stood up in January of 2020, or actually began monitoring in 2020, but our actual formal establishment of the and meeting of the committees began on March 4th. Our first case began on March, was on the campus on March 10th. 
the there have been a number of lessons learned in that first case, and it's something that I, I'm foreshadowing to a you know a later part of this presentation is that you know as much as we're a provider, we're an employer, and a number of the issues we faced in that first case was the environment that we were working in and in providing a safe work environment for our for our team members. We had from that first case, because there was an atypical presentation, the symptomology wasn't what was first promulgated by the CDC. Later there was an addition and this was had to do with you know GI distress. Our first case was on March 10th. Um, I don't mind disclosing this patient was in the house for a few days before we discovered they were positive. We had 80 temp team members exposed. Um, and as a result of that, you know, we were in a position of, you know, having a conversation. Does everyone go home? Do they all self quarantine? Um, as you can imagine, sending 80 team members home would be very disruptive to the operation, especially in the face of, um, this emerging pandemic. And as a result of that, thankfully all 80 team members tested negative, but there were a lot of lessons learned about, you know, safe and work environment, safe work environment. And I'll speak to that a little bit later in the presentation. I'm gonna, and I would like this to be more of a dialogue than a monologue. So I'm gonna take periodic pauses to take questions. Um, I'd rather do that, you know, as we're going through. Um, so, Kathy, I would ask you to, if you can help facilitate the questions during the presentation versus towards the end. I'll I'll help that, Jason. This okay, is good. thank you, Mike. And are there any questions at this point? None so far. Okay, Kathy, if you could please advance. So, a little bit about. How we operationally uh, were addressing and continue to address. I should not. I find myself falling into this trap of suggesting that the um, the concern surrounding COVID or this crisis has passed. You know, it hasn't, um, and we. It is concerning that we are starting to see a spike in cases again. But as it relates to our plan, you know, operationally to address. Um, what was of concern in terms of what capacity we created we, we had a multi-phase plan and it addressed everything from the facilities to how do we limit transmission you know to our visitors to our patients to our team members um, and i'm not going to read this to you but you get a sense of the the level of planning and i should also point out that this planning was not done in isolation we had an active involvement with the county eoc and I do want to commend, you know, a number of folks, but Linda Stoughton, especially as she was, you know, the conductor of the symphony, working with, you know, Hunter Conrad, John Regan, um, working with the the city police chief, uh, Chief Fox, Chief Hardwick, working with our fire chiefs, um, you know, with working with our school superintendent, there were a number of folks that were involved in this discussion of how do we prepare, not only as an organization, but as a community. So from the standpoint of uh, taking it through the Flagler lens, you can see some of the accommodations that were made, everything from creating outdoor test sites to creating a triage tent with our ER to limit, again, um, any exposure we did go through the process where there is no visitation at this point. We do make accommodations um, for folks, obviously special fo folks in extenuating circumstances. I think the bigger point that I would wanna make here is if you look to the far right of the slide, we were not overrun. We were in a position where we had capacity of at least 98 dedicated COVID beds. We were nowhere near that. I think at our peak, we were around 21. Um, most facilities, and certainly in the Northeast, there was a concern over ICU beds and you know, adequate ventilators. Um, we, we you know, up to this point, have, and that stems to today, have only had 20 cases. We have three in-house today. So our experience um, isn't the same as what we've seen in other states. And even in 
state of Florida, it's not a monolithic event. South Florida is much different than Northeast Florida. So I'm gonna to continue to uh, advance if we could. And again, if there are questions, you know, Mike, Kathy, if you could just let me know. So in terms of some of the efforts we made working with the community, working with you know our partners with the Department of Health, and I want to commend Don Alacock for all the work that she's done in um, you know in addressing this. She's been vital as part of the safety net. But we also recognized that we had a responsibility, um, you know, in terms of providing a test site. So we and we stood up a test site in March and, and just closed it a couple of weeks ago when we saw over 2,000 uh, residents and we, we took on the mantle of the cost of doing this, subsidizing it to the tune of about 100,000 a month. Um, but beyond the testing itself and the collection sites, we, did, we also understand um, that there have been these social determinant impacts you know, working with our social responsibility organization, Care Connect. There are a number of folks, you know, you know the 18,000 uh, service workers that lost their jobs. There are a number of, you know, the unemployed that need help with rental assistance, food deliveries, helping them, you know, with finding employment, online support groups. We partnered with Epic because you can imagine, you know, that there were, and from a standpoint of episodes, behavioral health episodes, there was a spiked increase and we wanted to make sure that there was access for these folks um, in terms of their behavioral health. If you'll continue. So as I mentioned today, you know, we've seen close to 20 patients. Um, we have supported more than 500 families with access to food and rental assistance through Care Connect. We have folded in the, the testing into our normal operations. And we, for those residents that you know are still looking for testing and those employees of yours, are, um, they can be seen at our urgent care centers in our lab. An interesting point in terms of the financial recovery, I know that there was a lot of fanfare over a recent, um, I won't say fanfare, but notoriety surrounding a recent report from the uh, Northeast Regional, Northeast Florida Regional Council about the impacts of COVID on Northeast Florida. And certainly we understood that there was going to be a contraction. You know, and I think they were suggesting that the unemployment levels would be worse than the national average, um, that the financial impacts would be more dire than what we're seeing nationally. I, I will say that I take issue with the report. That's hard for me to believe. And because I do believe the fundamentals of St. John's County are very strong. And even Northeast Florida for that matter, greater Northeast Florida. Um, but what it does show is that there is a V-shaped recovery. And I think some of our data supports that, you know, um, as I think most of you are aware, the governor through his executive order had all healthcare organizations stand down on elective procedures and then had a staged reopening, which we're in. I'm proud to say that in the month of May, we're already at 92% of pre-COVID activity. Um, and you can see in some of the other key procedures, we're getting close. Emergency care is an interesting um, dynamic. We know nationally, emergency care visitors are down 40%. And we're not far off from that, as you can see. We, you know, we've seen, and those volumes continue to be suppressed. So there is a concern of, you know, as we start thinking of going forward, what does that mean for us as an organization? And what is the new normal? So that, again, a little foreshadowing for in the next part of the presentation. I'm going to pause. I think we have a question, Mike. Yes. Um, so I, I think the community uh, supports Flagler Health Plus and the hospital there, uh, but there's con concern with the with the economics of it. Um, has a hospital reached a normal caseload? And if not, what is the lost revenue? Uh, how long until Flagler Hospital sees a normal utilization of the services there? Well, and you know, and 
some of that, again, the May numbers, and I realize it's only one month and it doesn't, you know, it isn't a trend, but it does demonstrate that there is some level of bounce back. To, the, to date, we have seen is it from our top line about a $15 million impact. We have received some federal funding. Um, the vast majority of it is a loan that we're gonna have to pay back. Um, as, as it relates to the funding that we've received as a grant, it only covers around 40% of the lost revenue. Um, so as much as or, um, it's touted that, you know, healthcare is recession proof. There have been dramatic impacts to, you know, to, the, to this health system and many others, as you've seen that the, in the month of April, there was a report put out by Kaufman Hall that showed that the operating margin, the EBITDA operating margin for health systems was minus 29%. So dramatic impacts. Um, in terms of lost revenue nationally, we're looking at $250 billion just in the month of April. Yeah, those are big, big figures. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to see you've, you've got some of that covered within a grant there. My, uh, my wife's in healthcare, and, and the, the thing that I've been hearing lately from her and her, her friends are that the uh, hospitals um, haven't gotten back up to 100% but before the crisis. Uh, there's, there's still some apprehension there. And I guess uh, it'll take some, some time to, to, to weed through that. The, what, what we have discussed with our governance and our, with, or with, with our board rather, is that the impacts of this we expect to continue at, through on at least our next fiscal year. And that would take us through um, September of 2021. Um, as it relates to how we're addressing the new normal, uh, we have estimated that the level of activity will be somewhere in the neighborhood of 85 to 90 percent of pre-COVID activity. Right. Do you think the federal government will cover all of the testing costs? There is, and again, currently, and through some of the uh, legislation is paid. There is an expectation that these these testing costs are covered by the by the managed care organizations. Medicare covers these as well. Question is, is will that be ongoing? And we don't know at this point. Okay, to to, to clear it up because there's been some misinformation. Do you need to have a referral to get a test? For for our testing. With, as it relates to our site, we are we request a physician order. There is a concern of unnecessary testing. Um, others that are being tested, you know, and I, we've seen this at other test sites. There are those fe there are federal test sites that do not require it. Um, but as it relates, and this isn't driven, at least our perspective on this isn't driven based on the economics. It's just rest being addressed based on what we think is good medicine. So we are requiring a physician order. Thank you. That's all we have for now. Okay. So if we could move to the next slide. So as we, we think about where we are today from the standpoint of our responsibility the community is as an employer, um, we continue to advance our strategic plan and, and the growth strategy that we put into place. Again, it never deviates from my, what our vision is and our mission is as an organization, and that, that's addressing healthcare writ large. It's both fiscal, social, and economic health. So continued activity continues, our continued activity is occurring um, with, we, we opened our recent health village in the World Golf Village in July. Our health village in Nocatee is on track to open in November. Our health and wellness campus at Durban Park in collaboration with UF Health continues to progress with an expected groundbreaking in September. And then again, and this is another lesson learned post COVID. And I say post COVID and I keep falling into that trap because it is during COVID um, is that 
the way folks are going to access care is going to be different. And that has everything to do with telemedicine. Um, the government um, provided a series of waivers that took away some of those restrictions that allow uh, more easy access uh, as it relates to digital medicine. Seema Verma, who is the head of CMS, said yesterday it's hard for her to imagine anyone going back. So I think that the way people access care is going to be different than the way that it has been previously. And your digital strategy is center is a centerpiece to how we provide care going forward. So I'm going to pause there. Are there any questions? I do have one um, from Welcome Home Care. Uh, do you believe that the case managers will increase their home health care referrals? So, so let me answer that question a little bit differently than the way it was posed. I would suggest that home health is going to be vital as we move forward. You know, we at Flag are instituted a hospital at home program. Um, for those cases that, you know, let's say more acute, we actively engaged home health to help us in that regard, our home health, um, our, the home health arm of our organization. Um, so the straightforward answer is yes. Um, uh, because again, people are still, and you can see this as it relates to the ER volumes, they are still leery of coming to the hospital to access care. So we have said differently, we need to bring the care to them. Right, right. We, we have one other about a turnaround time for COVID test results, and I assume that's still about three days? Well, no, so some distinctions here. Um, we do have in-house testing, um, but, and again, this is a function of the availability of the test, which the in-house test we can turn around in 45 minutes. As you know, there are two types of tests. So there's the genetic test and then there's serology uh, blood test. And right now, because uh, of the essentially the false negative issues that we're having with the serology test, we're still defaulting to genetic test. Um, but we are prioritizing the use of the in-house test for those that, you know, for, whether it's a staff member and or someone that is in an acute position, meaning going to be admitted uh, for the community at large, we are still doing collection. So we, we work with commercial labs, Quest, LabCorp, um, the Department of Health, and Mayo, and the average turnaround time now is about 24 hours. Okay. So I think this is a nice segue to, to move into you know, the what's next scenario. And I do have, have some, we have our partners from Healthfully today on, on this call to, to demonstrate some of the, the next frontier as it relates to how we provide care, how we provide care in the face of COVID. And again, I would remind you beyond just being a provider, um, we are an employer. And we are as concerned as others about ensuring that we're providing a safe workplace. And, you know, it's clear that there is a concern that if, should you not have a system installed to do such a thing, you could open yourself up to a fair amount of liability or risk. So with that being said, and again, based on the lessons we've learned with the exposures that we've had and how we had to go through the process, at least initially, um, we think that there's a better way to provide care to using our digital technology. Um, we have the good fortune of you know, providing a solution that's end to end, meaning not only the digital solution, but should there be testing, should there be clinical care, we can provide uh, the care that's required. And I thought, and then this is not gonna be a sales slick, but what I'd like to do is have Paul Viscovich, who's the CEO, Mark Boudreau uh, from Healthfully to just take you through a brief walkthrough because I think it's instructional from the standpoint of certainly what we're doing to make sure there's a safe workplace, but this integration of care and digital technology moving forward. So Paul. Sure. 
Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you, Jason. Uh, and it is a privilege to work with uh, Flagler Health Plus. They're, they're, they're a great partner. Um, can we move to the uh, next slide? Uh, yeah, as Jason uh, has, has talked about, um, uh, Flagler Health Plus uh, has got, uh, over the last few months, a lot of experience in, in managing uh, COVID-19 and how that affects the workplace uh, and, and your colleagues. Um, so uh, with Flagler Health Plus uh, and Healthly together, we've, um, we've uh, taken those learnings uh, and put them into a digital platform uh, to help fellow employers uh, get back to work safely uh, based on those lessons. Uh, so Healthly is providing the, the digital health platform uh, for uh, Flagler Health, and that's an existing platform that's proven. Um, and the idea with that is for people to be able to access uh, their healthcare digitally for things such as uh, uh, telehealth, uh, scheduling appointments, uh, getting in line for lab tests and so forth. Uh, and we've configured that for an employer-based solution. Uh, so uh, employees and, and colleges and schools and other <coughs> institutions can use this to open back up safely. Um, there's, there's two parts to it. The employee or the student uses the app to, to monitor symptoms and, and, and look for uh, guidance on, on what the next step is. Um, and then uh, on the uh, employer or, or college side, uh, you get a dashboard of uh, how your people are doing and, and how you can best help them uh, through uh, this journey. Uh, next slide. Uh, I'll hand over to uh, Mark Woodrow and he can go through uh, some of this detail. Great, thanks Paul. Um, so yeah, our uh, partnership with Flagler Health um, really allows us to produce a, a complete workplace safety solution that addresses the end-to-end -end process of exposure management, prevention and clinical testing and you know thereby reducing the overall risk and liability to employers. Now most of the other niche solutions out there that have recently come out uh, don't really have the level of integration between the work environment and the clinical environment. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, I think we're all back. Um, so, yeah, um, so our technology solution is um, because we're a health tech company, we uh, abide by the highest uh, privacy and security standards for, for healthcare. And um, our overall platform supports a number of key components. And from the very uh, left side of the diagram going right, you can see we have employee virtual communities. This is very similar to uh, Facebook communities, but they're HIPAA compliant. And so we provide COVID education communities as well as isolation support communities. Uh, providers can also uh, have uh, additional communities and employers can have their own communities related to what they want to communicate for, uh, for example, COVID policy. And then going to the right, we have the employee self-reporting uh, solution, which is based, uh, you know, has a couple components. It has a symptom checker based on CDC guidelines, and then there's the daily screen or attestation. And uh, if there's any um, uh, answers to that daily screen that uh, produce an alert, then we can refer uh, that employee to have a virtual consult with the doctor, which you see is under health services. So we integrate 
virtual visits uh, to make that process uh, very seamless for the employee. And then, uh, of course, uh, the, the physician can order uh, a lab test, and we also, again, facilitate the process with the employee to get in line for a test at the, the appropriate location. Those test results are then incorporated into the application. And if there's a, a positive result, uh, then that is shared with the employer. And I, I must stress that it's only the COVID result that's being shared with the employer. There's no other health information or health data that's shared uh, with the employer. Then the other component that we have is contact tracing, and this is contact tracing as it relates to the workplace specifically. So uh, what we do is we record all of the work locations that an employee is assigned to, including their sublocations, and, and that works really well for uh, work environments that have the standard office assignments. But we also have scheduled events, and um, so we can record, uh, for example, in schools and courts and other businesses where uh, the business was, revolves around going to specific buildings like, you know, uh, uh, schools where you have various classroom schedules. And then below that, you uh, see another component that we're offering. Um, at the end of June is proximity reporting and that's based on Bluetooth technology and that's an optional feature not everybody will sign up for that um, but it's pretty cool in the sense that it knows when two phones from the same uh, employer uh, have come into contact e with each other so two employees that have downloaded the app uh, the phone will be able to uh, determine that they've been in contact with each other less than six feet. And we record the fact that they've been contacted uh, in, in that distance and the, the amount of time uh, that they've been within six feet. And, and so we don't record location, so there's no tracking of where employees are. It's just, hey, you've been in contact with another employee during the work hours. And again, that's an optional uh, feature. Then moving off to the right, the last piece, which is the really cool part for employers, um, you have an employee uh, dashboard that uh, quickly gives you a list of all of your employees in a very simple format of red, green, blue, you know, red meaning this employee is isolating and should not be coming into work. Green, here's all the employees that are uh, clear to come into work. Blue, here's the employees that are in transition, meaning they're just getting tested and we're, we're not sure of their status quite yet. And uh, so there's some caution associated with those. So very simple employee results. The next piece is Really, um, once you know that an employee has tested positive, then you can do a workplace exposure assessment. And this tool really, what it does is allows you to pick the employee that has been tested positive and it lists all of the work locations and sub locations within your workspace that have likely been exposed. So this allows for you know, very easy cleaning and, and uh, you know, addressing the workspace environment. But what it also does is it gives you a list of all of the employees that are also assigned to that specific work locations and uh, therefore are suspect of having uh, contracted uh, COVID-19. And then we provide the tools to, very, to, to, to easily uh, recommend those employees go get tested or go, or go see a doctor, depending on your workplace policy. So with that overview, I'm gonna pass it to Josh, who's going to uh, give you an overview of what employees uh, use as their tool set for this solution. Josh? Mark, if I can interrupt you, um, a couple of quests, questions have erupted here. What, what's the website or, or the name of this app? It's uh, called Healthfully. Okay. And, and, and the, web, the website, uh, you can reach our website by typing in um, healthfully.io. Got it. Is, is there a cost? for this solution to employers? 
Yes, there is. It's, it's based on a, a subscription model, very similar to a, a time and attendance uh, solution that you would see in the marketplace. So there, there is a subscription pricing associated with this. It starts at $7 per employee per month and goes all the way down to a dollar um, based on you know the, the the number of employees and the size of the organization obviously the bigger the organization uh, the, the uh, uh, lower uh, monthly cost per unit thank you does it take a fair amount of time to, to sift through this or does the app uh, like I like your idea here of the uh, the, uh, the dashboard at the end there. Yeah, we'll actually give you some screenshots of uh, the dashboard at the end, and you'll see how easy it is um, to manage this. We see a lot of solutions out there that um, are very costly for the employer uh, in terms of resources and amount of attention that's required. We think this solution that we're presenting today is, is uh, something that's very sustainable for the long run for most employers and does not require a lot of uh, excess resources to implement. But I will get to the employer dashboard near the, uh, after Josh presents, his, presents the uh, employee uh, part of the solution. Okay, please, please go ahead. Sorry to interrupt you there. All right, Josh, uh, I'll hand it over to you. And if you can advance the slide, it'd be great. I think jo Josh needs to be unmuted. Josh, you have the power to unmute yourself? Yes, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm here. Thank you. I was uh, trying to find the unmute and I got it. Um, yeah, so I, I, I'm just going to walk you guys through these screens here on, on how the application works. You know, Mark walked you guys through the blueprint um, as to how we get people onboarded, um, all the stuff that, you know, what the application can do. But from just kind of the user perspective, from your, the employees, from the students, from the end user of the application, um, I'll start on the far left. So the first time logging into the system, it's invite only. It is HIPAA secure, so we do things strictly through invitations. Um, so from an onboarding perspective, we, re we receive flat files of here's our list of employees, um, here's their contact detail, work email, or phone number so we can invite them. When they get invited, they accept the terms and conditions, you know, a privacy policy, any other consent forms for FERPA um, that the employer is requiring. And then they do that once and they're launched into the application. So on the left-hand side here, you're going to see them in the health board. So that's where we enact all action in the system. So you see there at the top, you see my to-dos. It might be a little blurry if your screen's not big enough, but that top box is where we tell them, this is what you're to do next in the system. So this is automated responses of action that needs to be taking, self-attestations of symptoms. Um, we have uh, algorithmic COVID assessments based on, this is my travel history, pre-existing conditions, and then we, we populate a risk um, for exposure risk for whatever it may be. So we kind of take all of these things and we automate and guide people through the process. So um, I'll, I'll walk through what that looks like from an automation perspective, but just to orient you on the application itself. And then if you leverage Flagler's clinical team or the clinical community, we have that see a provider button. So that's where people have access to schedule a virtual consult, schedule an office appointment, get in line for a, a lab, get in line for an imaging test, um, get access to, to virtual urgent care, just a whole volume of clinical services that at this time is, is important. Um, and then below that, you'll see my appointment. So again, if I do leverage those clinical services, I do have that list of my appointments listed there below. So if I schedule a virtual consult, I'll see my virtual consult. If I get in line for a lab at a specific time, you'll see my lab listed. So it just gives people an overarching um, holistic view of, of, you know, not only just this program, but their health in general if they, they use Flagler's clinical services. The middle part there, that's the symptom tracking. So uh, on a daily basis, we'll, we'll jump people through, you know, eight in the morning, they get a text message, for example, saying, hey, we need you to complete a self-attestation. And they'll, they'll come in and they'll, they'll complete that form. So they'll say, you know, I have a couple of symptoms. Um, and as soon as they hit complete, that's where we automate things in the system. So based on that self-attestation, we'll tell them, hey, you reported no symptoms. 
you're, you know, you're good to continue coming to work. And here is the guideline we have in our specific workplace. So everything is specific to each employer. If they attest to some symptoms, we'll prompt them with a response that is based on what the employer wants, wants their employees to do. But that will say, you know, we, please go get, get a test, get a virtual consult. What we just prompt them to that, that automated response as to what they're to do next in the system. Um, if you want to jump to the next screen, I'll, I'll talk through some of the other stuff. So again, we have full accessibility to, um, you know, leverage virtual care with Flagler's physicians. So you can just see an example of, of a virtual consult on our application. If you do access clinical services, you have the ability to securely message with those providers. So you have full access to um, communicate outside of that virtual consult or a telephone call. You can message them. So say you did test positive for COVID you would have access to communicate with a provider in a HIPAA secure environment. So it just gives you a nice, you know, tertiary access to, to the healthcare space than um, phone in person or virtual uh, visit. And then on the far right there, that's what our communities look like. So like Mark said, they're HIPAA secure Facebook groups. Um, they're moderated by a combination of uh, healthfully Flagler Health Plus's clinical and, and wellness team. And then we have some employers who have requested to be a part of this as well. So what they are is, it's professional, you know, professional, um, knowledgeable people posting content. So, you know, reading through the news and all that stuff is very overwhelming. You don't know what guidelines came out. You don't know what exactly, you're, you know, you're supposed to do at that given time. Our teams read through all that information in that specific area or location, and we post that in, in a community of this nature. These allow people to ask questions on these. They're kind of like discussion forums. So if, if one of your end users has a question, they can put it on there and someone from that team will respond. Um, people are posting videos and photos and tips on what to eat, tips on you know what to do when you go out, when you go out in, in public. Um, so just kind of guiding people through this entire process and, and weeding through all of the news and, and putting the proper content in there. We do this on the other side as well with people that are in quarantine. So if someone is self-isolating, they do test positive or they're told to self-isolate, we have a peer support network that people can communicate with other people who are in self-isolation. So peer support has been proven on the mental health side to be very impactful for improving just the entire, um, you know, just view of this disease. So communicating with people who are self-isolating or are, have tested positive has been proven to be more impactful than communicating with your spouse or your family members who have not come across the disease or are not stuck in that, that self-isolation period. So we, we create this cohesive, uh, secure discussion forum where people in self-isolation can communicate uh, amongst each other. That again is moderated by professionals, by our team, by Flagler's team. So it's just a unique take on um, outside of clinical, it's kind of a social peer support um, part of, of the application. Um, if you want to dive to the next screen. Um, uh, I'll let Mark, Mark, you want to jump in on, on the, the dashboard piece? Because the, the biggest question for all the employers out there is where does this data go and what can we do with it? Um, so obviously the employee is taking a ton of action in the system. We're receiving a ton of feedback and, and data in, the, in, in what's going on. So um, I'll let Mark should talk through what the employer sees um, on, on the dashboard that we, we spin up for each each employer group. Yeah, thank, thank you very much, Josh. And yeah, so there, there was a question about, you know, what's involved from um, the employer perspective and, you know, how many resources do you need uh, to manage this system? And, and um, you'll see that uh, really this, this is usually a function of uh, management or HR. Uh, it's, it's not a full-time job involved this, in this. You're not sending out resources to, you know, cover all the entrances to buildings with people with you know, temperature scanners. This is, uh, this is really based on um, the app that uh, Josh just uh, demonstrated uh, through self-attestation and linkages with, uh, with the health systems services. And uh, this component of the employer dashboard is directly uh, part of the solution. So you see one of the, the pieces up here is uh, the exposure assessment. So uh, so you see there's a uh, resource here, Mr. Karbosh um, had tested positive on May 13th and um, he's in isolation for the next 13 days. And what you can see that we've clicked down on that drop down list for Mr. Karbosh and it already lists all of the locations that he's been assigned to uh, in the employer's uh, 
office structure. And uh, so those are the locations that are, are at risk or have been exposed. So you may have a cleaning protocol in place to address that. Um, but more importantly, you see to the right that, oh, here's all of the employees that have also been assigned to those work locations. And so those employees are at risk to have, of having contact tracted uh, COVID-19. And it's very easy for me to then click on those employees and, and uh, send out a, 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 an overall task to them to, to go get tested or go see a, a doctor based on your employer policy. So that's uh, exposure assessment. That's, uh, you know, that's the cool part of this solution. Um, can we move to the next slide? Uh, workforce status is, again, that very simple uh, red, green, blue uh, status of your entire workforce. So you can go down your workforce and quickly see which employees should be coming into work, which employees should not be coming to work to stay home, and which ones need to uh, get tested. So very simple. You can drill down into these uh, screens. You can just look at all of the um, the resources that have tested positive and should be isolated. So uh, there's some flexibility there. You can also send, again, tasks and notifications to various groups. Uh, next slide. Mark, this is Mike. Can I ask you, can I ask you to break for a second? I've got a couple of quest questions here. Sure. Um, how does an employer sign up for the Healthfully Flagler Plus solution? And can you tell us about the next steps and, and going through that, that process? Oh, okay. So, yeah. So, uh, it, you know, please just reach out to any of the, the presenters today uh, would be the start. You can also book a uh, consultation right on our website uh, directly. Um, so there's a number of ways to get in touch with us. So that would start the process. And now in terms of implementation, it's, it's a pretty simple process. This, this product exists today. So there's, there's uh, a, about two weeks of configuration that we do. And um, that configuration involves a couple of things. So the first thing it involves is getting a list of all of your employees and their uh, either their email address or phone number it doesn't matter which it's the, it's the way we invite them to join the solution uh, they'll get an invite from us they'll be asked to download the app and um, so that's how that component works the other uh, piece of data that we'll be asking for you during those two weeks is all of the locations and sublocations that those employees will be assigned to. So we get that list again in a very simple flat file like a spreadsheet, uh, and then we load that into the system, right? And then the next thing that we do with the employer is to work on the workflow and um, tasks assignment within the system. It's completely configurable. And what we do there is we configure that to align with the employer's policy. So, um, you know, you will have some preferences in terms of, you know, uh, uh, you know, how the uh, workflow should work, um, which particular providers you want to see. I mean, within uh, the Flagler uh, uh, healthcare region. Obviously, we already have the linkages with uh, Flagler Health uh, televisits and uh, Flagler uh, testing. Uh, but if you're outside of other regions, we will, you know, work with your local uh, providers and local local testing capa uh, capacity. For example, schools will have their own clinic uh, on site. So there is a configuration and and uh, a uh, a uh, employer policy that we we uh, tune into the solution to, to. So that complete process takes about um, two weeks uh, from start to finish, and it's and the the lag time is really usually based on the employer just getting you know their information together and, and providing it to us. Um, the configuration is actually a pretty quick process. 
Right. Is, is, is there a dovetail to get your own insurance company involved as well? So we have a lot of flexibility on how the insurance works. So, you know, the, the people ask how, how does, how much does this cost? So there's two components to cost. There's the technology itself, right? And that's a subscription that is billed to the employer. And then there's the health services themselves, right? And the health services themselves will be billed in a number of two ways. They can be billed through uh, the employee's insurance, or what we can do is bill the uh, employer directly and have the employer uh, cover that through their own uh, insurance. So that varies from you know, health system to health system. I don't know if, uh, Jason, you would like to uh, add any color to that in terms of uh, billing from a clinical services perspective? Yes, thank you, Mark. So again, in our experience, it's been that the insurance covers it. We do require a physician order. Um, I would say, again, I will remind you, from the onset, there has been uh, an expectation that the MCOs cover these costs. Um, as I mentioned before, the governmental payer, Medicare, is, is covering these costs, are covering these costs. So from an employer standpoint, we would expect with the physician order that you would have coverage. So primarily, Mark gave you the two pathways. You know, one, again, is through your managed care or through your insurance company or directly the employer. The vast majority are going through the insurance company. Thanks, Jason. So, yeah, so net net, you know, on the clinical side, it, there shouldn't be anything new there. And really, the only additional cost here is uh, for an employer would be the um, subscription service for the software. Mike, are there any other questions or can I continue? Uh, please continue. Okay. So this last screen that I, I wanted to show you is um, the, compli the employee compliance um, uh, dashboard. And what this allows management to do is have a, have a sense of how employees are complying with the program. So because this is all based on self-attestation through the daily screen that will be done, you know, every day at whatever time you feel is appropriate for us to remind every employee to do their screen, um, this report will allow you to very quickly see who's behind in their screening. So you can see, um, you know, the comp compliance breakdown here that at the bottom with the purple, you see screening past due that 9% of your workforce in this example, it hasn't done their daily screen. And then what you can do is look down at the compliance details and, and you can see the two people that, you know, have, uh, have been late in doing their daily screen and, you know, one is three days behind, the other person is one day behind. And so, you know, you can easily click on them and then assign them a task that, hey, you know, redo your screen or go see a doctor. So, you, so this tool gives you that bird's eye view in terms of how compliant um, is your organization with a policy that you've uh, set forth. So we, again, we can configure this uh, to match uh, an employer's uh, comp comp um, policy. And with that, uh, that is the end of the technology presentation. Thank you. Uh, we've got about four minutes left. Um, Jason, do you wanna uh, try and wrap this up? Well, again, I, I think just the broader point, you know, we wanted to make is, is that as we continue to navigate through this, you know, these unprecedented times, you know, as, an, as a provider, we're very mindful of making sure that providing safe workplace environment as well as an employer. And I certainly think this has application to those that are, you know, a number of business owners that are on this call. Um, so we wanted to give you an idea of, you know, again, this is the continued innovation of medicine. And, you know, Mark makes a point uh, that every 
organization now has to be a digital health company because of the pandemic. And I, I think that's, you know, I think that's spot on as an assessment. So I'm going to stop. If there are any other questions, I'll certainly take them now. Okay. Um, while I get some here, I, I just want to say this is new to me and I'm, I'm pretty uh, thrilled to, to see this digital health platform come out. I, I think this is pretty powerful here. I think this is what we're all going to be, be seeing here certainly in, in, in the future. Um, questions here. What's the ideal size of a company to use the solution? I think that's a variable. Uh, uh, yeah, go ahead, Mark. Yeah, I was, I, I was going to say, um, you know, you could do all this on paper, um, but when you start getting into any, any size company over 10 people, it starts to get more difficult. So, I, you know, the short answer is, you know, 10 to 10,000, like there's really no limit on the upper side, but, um, uh, you know, the, yeah, even a small organization will benefit from the compliance features in this organization, in this solution, as well as the tele, telemedicine com, components. So I, I would say all sizes. Yeah, I, I could see this being very powerful for the, for the larger employers like B of A or Merrill Lynch or something where, um, you know, just knowing my friends, they're, you know, I'm quizzing them on when they expect to come back to work and, and they're saying no one's telling them anything until November. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And even a small organization, though, you know, you're more dependent on resources than any, uh, than, than let's say a, a, a large organization. So any one resource, you know, the time that it takes to get screened versus, and then get uh, positioned into uh, see physician right away virtually and then get uh, into testing right away is probably even more crucial. So I, I would say even for small organizations, there's something to be said about the integration and the efficiency of this end-to-end -end process that that is probably even more important to small organizations. So, yeah. Okay. Well, we're getting close to running out of time here. Isabel, would you like to add something to the to the question and answer session? Yes, can you hear me? Yep. All right. Um, I just wanted to say thank you for putting this uh, um, system out to our employers. Uh, I think that it's going to be important moving forward that we are all able as employers to manage our workforce and the ebb and flow of this uh, COVID-19 throughout the workforce and the impact. And I think that being able to manage that will really allow us to continue to be efficient as an, you know, as employers in what we're doing while still protecting our employees uh, moving forward. And this is, as Jason mentioned earlier, the new normal for us as um, employers moving forward. So I really appreciate this platform and being available. We'll share more information to our membership uh, regarding this um, tool that is available. And I am um, um, excited that we have that in our county and beyond for our members. So thank you, Jason, for and thank you to your team for putting this together. Appreciate it. Of course. Thank you for having us today. Um, Jason, if we have one more question uh, to be answered, someone did ask if colleges are thinking about providing this app to their students as well as their staff. I, I can answer that or I can have Mark answer it, but the straightforward answer is we are already working with a college to do both. Yeah, and I'll just add to that, uh, nationwide, we received um, all kinds of queries uh, from uh, colleges, and it seems to be the most active right now. They're all worried about students uh, coming back into the work, the, the environment. So that's, our solution is get, you know, configured specifically around classrooms and, and whatnot. So we satisfy that need for both the employer side of uh, the college as well as the students. That's a great application there. Okay, I've got a little bit past 1030 now and I know we had a hard stop for an hour. So uh, before we close today, I'd like to thank Jason and the Flagler Health Plus team for all their efforts 
you know, including uh, Mark, Paul, and Josh, um, and especially th through Flagler for the COVID-19 pandemic uh, efforts, and for sharing your time with us this morning. Uh, today's discussion was recorded, and the recording will be available on the Chamber's website under Chamber Webinars for playback at a later date. I encourage you all to visit the Chamber's website at www.sjcchamber.com and follow the Chamber on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, and Instagram for information and resources. On behalf of the Chamber's Economic Development Council, I wish to thank all Chamber members and guests for your attendance and participation in today's discussion. Again, thank you all very, very much. This was very informative. I think it's a wonderful tool and um, has a lot of applications here. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your time.